Okay, welcome back. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's uh, take it one step further. We're joined this morning by uh, Ismail Ahmed O.N. He's a former national youth leader of the APC and former senior special assistant to the president. And a former, uh, he also did aspire for the Kano Central Senatorial election in 2023. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Well, let me start with that visit to the president. Um, because tomorrow, this morning in the dailies, he was talking about, yes, you know, he received the team, the ACF team, and he said, um, don't forget the governors and the local governments, that we need to put word there so that they indeed can ensure development comes to residents in the state. 774 local governments, people would leave there. So if governors were to do a lot more, the country would have been a lot better. How did the ACF take that message? I think they took it very well. I think they took it very well. I think it was, they were really encouraged by it. And um, I think the federal government was quite smart in the mm -hmm. way they go about uh, this, uh, the pursuit of this, because I heard that they have instituted a case in the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, I think the president, in his wisdom, just thought that, um, okay, how, why fix it if it's not broken? You know, because several years... Uh, in the past, the, several administrations have tried to amend the constitution to see that there is uh, some sort of local government autonomy. And I think this government is saying that, okay, why don't we just try what we already have in the constitution? Because if the constitution clearly spells out the local governments, then which means the federal constitution recognizes the existence of these local governments. Why don't we just go to Supreme Court and have a, an interpretation? you know, that this local government should be autonomous because I think that is the idea uh, behind the creation of local governments. Uh, so so I, uh, the ACF, from what I get, from what I gather uh, after the meeting yesterday, they took it very well. It's something that they are going to sit down with their governors and other um, uh, government um, uh, elected and appointed officials to see that the essence of governance starts at the grassroots and local governments must it's non-negotiable, must be allowed to function effectively at that level for us to be able to tame some of these uh, uh, issues that we have at the, so at the grassroots level. So citizens think that it should be straightforward, that local, local governments function, state governments function, federal government function. They take it for granted that that should happen naturally without any resistance whatsoever. But in last government, when I think they tried to pay monies directly to local government, these governors were up in arms against that. They didn't kind of like it. So it came across to Nigerians as though something was amiss, that they were guarding, quote unquote, their territory. What did, what are Nigerians missing? Why does it look as if the governors don't want anything to happen with the local governments? I don't know. I don't get it. I think local government autonomy has been one of the perennial issues that everybody wants it. Mm -hmm. And yet it never gets done, right? The National Assembly always gets to pass it in an amendment in the constitutions that they do almost every four years, oh, I yeah. guess. And then once it gets to the National Assembly for concurrences, uh, where it's supposed to get the two-thirds of the states, which is about 24 states' House of Assembly, uh, it never gets done. Now, some of the reasons some of the governors I've heard profile is that if we are, if, if Nigeria is actually operating a, democ a federation, a federal democracy, right? where the, there are three tiers of government. The federal government has its own strata. It controls, you know, it gives to the states. The states should be allowed to deal with their own local issues and local governments, you know, you know the way they should. Uh, they say that they have never seen any federal arrangement, federal government, federal structure, or federal uh, system that anywhere in the world where the federal government now pokes directly into the local government uh, as well. But, you know, that, that, that's an argument to just basically cover their territories as far as I'm concerned, because it is very clear that the assumption of the drafters of the Constitution is that governors would be reasonable enough to allow the local governments function effectively. Uh, but that hasn't been the case. Some governors in some states during their tenures have allowed local governments to function in terms of fiscal autonomy, uh, not necessarily political autonomy, because uh, I hardly see, no matter how much the, local, the governor allows the local government to get their funding, 
uh, when it comes to election of local governments, you know, his party, whatever party he belongs to, the governor belongs to, uh, sweeps all the local governments. That's not this, because elections are neither here nor there, because it's, the elections are conducted by CX, which are the state electoral commissions, and those CX are probably just answerable to governors. So mm -hmm. I think it's, I don't know, I think the governors just see it as, you know, not allowing the federal government encroach in their space. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, the federal government is very clear that, okay, we have these problems that everybody just looks up to us. Yeah. Meanwhile, we have never for once denied any state or um, any local government, you know, their due, their statutory, you know, funding, or, uh, you know, and then we get blamed for all these things. Meanwhile, if we are allowed to do our job, the state governments are allowed to do their jobs, and the local governments are allowed to do their jobs. Uh, maybe we may not have some of the problems that we have. So I think it's been an argument that's been going on for a couple of few years. Indeed, I think that you know, one of the places where we see the argument happening also is in the National Assembly, mm. uh, especially when they now start to talk about, you, you've spoken about it, a constitutional amendment. Mm. Uh, there's a wholesale conversation now happening as to whether or not the entire presidential system is working. There are those who are saying, no, it's time for us to revert back to, twin, to parliamentary system of government. There are those who are actively seeking that even within the National Assembly. The question is, where should conversations like this be, be happening? Because sometimes people do not have confidence enough that the National Assembly will have the uh, courage to be able to push through with some of the reforms that they think are necessary for Nigeria to really be on a developmental track. In your own opinion, where do you think that, that kind of conversation should be happening? You know, I think, to be honest, I think parliamentary system is a bit more representative to the people than presidential, as being honest. Uh, presidential, I think, is uh, from the, our experience in the last 25 years, we're celebrating our civil jubilee right now of uh, uninterrupted civilian democracy. Um, f you know, presidential systems are a bit more, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they are a bit more command and control, right? Uh, you know, people just kind of acquiesce to, 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 to the people who are in the executive arm of government. They seem to control the other two arms of government fairly more easy, yeah, so to speak. And I think a lot of people believe that the presidential system of government in Nigeria actually was more akin to the, um, uh, the military you know, you know, regime. So because most of our constitutions, you know, starting from the 1979 constitution was birthed by military governments in 1978, 1976, 1978 under Obasanjo, mm -hmm. uh, first coming. And of course, the 1991 under Abdul Salami Abubakar. So, so they believe that the presidential system was more or less built around that. So once you have a governor and you, or you have a president who is not a Democrat at heart, right? Who does not understand that you should even practice and observe the Constitution as it should be, you know, with, even with its flaws, if it has been complied with much more than breached, we probably wouldn't be having the problems we're having. So the conversation a lot of people are having about parliamentary system of government. I personally believe it's a bit more representative. Uh, and, but I understand that Nigerians do not trust people in office, generally, to do uh, right by them. I think they, they believe that you know, almost everyone who gets into office just tries to make sure that there is kind of some regime security. You know, uh, to, to, but, but I think it's a fantastic conversation to have. And I think it's a debate that can start at the National Assembly, should be going on in all these political, social, cultural groups. Uh, and it's a conversation that we should have uh, as a country. How we go about it, though, uh, that's going to be a tough one. You know, it's going to be a tough one. I've seen so many attempts uh, by several people at different times in the course of the last 25 years of trying to reject the Constitution of this country. Uh, to change some sort of fundamental structure. Uh, just a simple example, the elections. Every election year, prior to the election year, uh, we have a, a Electoral Act Amendment. You know, so there's always one law, because even the laws as they are, you know, we find it hard to even observe or comply with them. So we keep changing the laws. We keep going for 
constitutional amendments almost on every every year or every assembly that comes in wants to do a constitutional amendment some things get passed some things never get passed so i don't know i think um the conversation should be happening um a lot of people may prefer to stick with the presidential system of government um but in the parliamentary i think it's also has a serious advantages and it's a bit more representative and it's less expensive what would you tell nigerians who are watching you right now and they say you're a member of the apc and last time they checked the price of petrol the cost of living the purchasing power they're worse off they were in the last time and one year on they thought they should have been in a better place right now but they're not first of all i would say i'm not i would say that um there are side effects to any major, uh, you know, remedy that comes. Uh, the president never missed towards during his campaign. I followed him all through to the third six to the, all the states that we've been through. We've gone during the campaign, and he has never promised that it was going to be easy. Uh, but he said there was there was something he once told me. He said that most of the hard decisions that have to be taken have to be taken within the first year of any incumbency. And uh, everyone talked about the removal of the fuel subsidy. Everyone talked about the removal, the unification of the exchange rate. Uh, everyone talked about that, but people were just, they were just political platitudes to them. For him, it was a serious promise that he needed to keep. <sighs> it's a tough time for a lot of Nigerians. I wouldn't lie to you about that. Households are filling the head on a daily basis, and um, I'm 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 even I'm I'm not happy with a lot of the people who are given the responsibility to administer uh, some of the ministers or heads of agencies that are not coming on TV on a daily basis to explain to Nigerians why we are going through what we are going through, even though they know why. The president has said that these decisions had to be taken. They were difficult decisions. He had taken them. They need to come to town and explain to people on a daily basis why we're doing that and where we're going so that people would be carried along. Uh, as a member of this party and as a member of this government, so to speak, I would say that I know it's, it's tough. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to say that um, it's easy for a lot of people. I know that uh, savings have been wiped out, uh, you know, um, and people can't just afford what they could afford, you know, a couple of you know, months back. Uh, but, so it's a tough time, and I, I would just say that let's hang in there for a little bit more. Uh, there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. But, it, you know, in addition to that, the Minister of State for Defense, uh, Mr. Matawale, mm. he was quoted to have said, up north, Look, ministers up north here speak about this matter, or you, or you get out. Because you also do understand that uh, several people, uh, fillers coming through there, they're not happy up north. Because, in fact, in addition to that, well, what is this that we hear that, well, they say, why is this government? You're, you're, you're talking about Lagos, Calabar, Coastal Road. You haven't even finished the Kano and, and roads and things like that. You abandoned that and you're doing the Coastal Road. You're not paying attention up north. Is that right? I don't think it's an abandonment, but I think it's a genuine concern. A lot of people have that. People have asked me directly that, what's going on? You know, Abuja, Kaduna has not been finished, and, uh, you know, you guys started at $240 billion during Buhari's regime. You know, the, the contractors came back with a revised version. It went up to about 500 and something billion, and then before the Buhari's regime ended, it went to about $897 billion, you know, and all that said, it has been done. And now we are hearing that you are doing a coastal project in Lagos to Calabar uh, for 13 trillion naira uh, for the first phase, which is going to cost about 1 trillion naira. And they heard that it has already been paid. What's going on? Uh, when is this? This is the most important road that links the whole of the seven states of the northwest to Abuja and almost about four or five states in the northeast. Uh, so what are we talking about? So people have asked me those questions, and those are valid arguments of people. I don't think the government has failed. I have directly contacted the Minister of Works, and we've talked about it. I have told him that he should visit those, uh, uh, that, that road. Not only that, the Kanome degree, uh, I think it's about um, 
to be completed. So government has not abandoned that road. I think that road has already been secured. The funding has been secured. Uh, part of the complaints that the contractors uh, gave for the reason why they had to stop work at some point because of insecurity has been addressed and so many things. And about the Lagos, Coast, Lagos Calabar Coastal Road, I think it's a very important economic role. And I, I've had this argument with a lot of people about even Lagos Ibadan, when a lot of people were complaining. Lagos Ibadan Road, as important as it is, or it sounds as if it's a southwest road, is even more important to a lot of northerners because, uh, you know, you park a lot, you get a lot of things from the ports in Lagos, and you drive through that road all the way uh, that comes to the north. And the president yesterday mentioned it to the ACF, and I know for a fact, I've spoken to uh, the Minister of Works on it, um, about the Sokoto Badagri uh, Road, and the study is about to be concluded, and the president wants to open up that road, do that corridor all the way from Sokoto down to Badagri, which is in Lagos, create dams along that line, and about one million acres of arable land, and have a lot of you know, farming and then irrigation on that sector. And then he's also looking at all the way down from Sokoto to, down to Maiduguri. But those are things that are going to happen later. So he is doing it with a corridor. He's always having a map in front of, in front of his desk, you know, looking at how he's going to open up the country through roads. And um, there was something he once said, that America became great because of its roads. You know, roads. So he believes that once you open up the space, once you make it easy and accessible for a lot of people, uh, it will be easier. So the Abuja Kaduna Road is not abandoned, uh, but I think the Ministry of Works and the minister have to make sure that the optics matter because people are complaining it's not a lie, and genuinely so because they, they have seen that uh, even the road between Kazaria and Kano has not been completely finished, and they, they, some are saying that people have, uh, you know, the contractors. Uh, have packed their, um, uh, their equipments out. I don't know if that is true. I have been following that road, you know, but half the time I've been driven, so I'm sleeping. <laughs> it's a beautiful road. But what I'm saying is that Kaduna Abuja is in bad shape. It needs to be completed, and government needs to show focus that the really this is really important. Kaduna Abuja is an access to almost all the northwestern and parts of the northeastern states. But the Sokoto Badagri is on course. Lagos, Calabar. It's a fantastic project as well. Samed, one of the things that excites me about all you have said is, you know, that, I mean, you speak with quite some optimism. I'm just wondering how you think Nigerians are taking um, the general body language. I mean, you talked about difficult decisions that need to be taken. Everyone knows that difficult decisions need to be taken. It is the impact that we never really hear about. So communication has been fairly, you know, on the low key to people so that they can even take ownership or embrace whatever, you know, wonderful or lofty initiatives the federal government is coming up with. So what would be your take on that? I mean, you talked about the fact that things are hard for Nigerians, but they didn't see any of this coming. How should they be, you know, reasoning with the federal government when they don't even know what the next thing is going gonna, is gonna to be? Your subsidy electricity tariff hike, uh, inflation rising, f cost of living rising, low salaries and all of those things, and we are supposed to just understand with our communication. I totally agree with you. 100% communication has, been, has not been impressive. That's all. I, 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 I was even shocked with that, actually. I thought, I thought, I thought that, um, you know, the the people who are responsible for communicating uh, with Nigerians about this should be on a weekly basis giving updates on what's going on and should have the buy-in of not only the general public but critical stakeholders that would go on and talk about it at different, uh, uh, at different uh, areas. I have said it a long time, I have said it several times that you know, there are more than 119 FM stations in the north alone. I doubt it if there's any of these FM stations that has a running program for 30 minutes on a weekly basis, you know, in local languages of people that understand that talks about what this administration is doing and where we're going next. And I think it's unfair 
uh, you know, uh, because some of these hard decisions, Nigerians need to know what's going on, and you need to speak the language. We are in a political government. Let's not fool ourselves as if that uh, uh, it doesn't matter. It matters, and it doesn't matter what you do. It only matters what people think you are doing. Mm. And right now, people don't think that that some of these decisions we are taking uh, has an ending. But we know that it is it is the right thing to do. Uh, the president has said it that he was going to take these decisions. So many presidents have tried it. They have promised it. They have not fulfilled it for one reason or another because of maybe political populism. But he has done it. Now it is left for the communicators and so many other people that believe in him uh, and support uh, the party on the one hand, the government uh, you know, communication managers, or even government people who are holding um, political positions need to go to town and talk to people and get the people carried on uh, on this, some of these issues. And mm -hmm. government needs to do uh, some of these things to show that it is demonstrating uh, knowledge and understanding uh, you know, with what people are going through and trying on a daily basis to help them solve this problem. So I totally agree with you uh, that communication has been underwhelming. It needs to be improved. Simple period, nothing to add more than absolute improvement in terms of communication. And it's not just about talking to people, it's about doing a whole lot more than that, you know, to carry right. people along. So I totally well, agree with you. That's on the one hand, and it, 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 perhaps the next conversation should be who will be taking the lead. I guess we'll leave them to do that. But there was something you said in response to the question that my colleagues, uh, Chamberlain and, and Malpue, have asked you. Uh, when you said that, you know, the, the, the states, I mean, you know, the federal government does one thing and then we're now making appeals to states. I'm wondering why that is necessary, given that on the one hand, uh, there are APC, uh, well, governors that came to office on the platform of the APC. I expect that at least there will be some kind of agreement among the, the APC that, look, we're going to do this and there should be no, we, we shouldn't have any significant opposition to it. Uh, and, of course, it will also be easier to carry some other governors all across the nation along. So for the, gov for the president to be making that call to uh, an ACF, which is, of course, but his right to do, one will wonder whether or not the governors, particularly on the APC platform and the president, are on the same page about this issue. I'm sure they are. They have their communication. The governors have their forum, the Progressive Governors Forum, which is led by the governor of Imo State, of course. And they have regular meetings with the president. And uh, I'm sure the president has laid out his concern. But what the president did yesterday was to call out a political, a social political group that covers all region, that is non-partisan, non uh, to call on all governors, all the 19 governors uh, in the north, or by extension, all the 36 governors of the federation. Um, to see that, look, this is a real problem. And everybody agrees. You know, I keep saying it. It's the one thing that almost everybody seems to want, and somehow, over the course of the last two decades, have not ha it has not happened. So the question is why? You know, who is the stumbling block, or what is the stumbling block? And that needs to be... So the president is appealing to everyone as a president of the whole entire nation, not the president of APC. And, um, you know... There's something I want to say about the party and government. You know, in, in Nigeria, it's, 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 the party is the only situation where you have the vehicle where people just get elected into office. The moment they get elected into office, then all of a sudden they become bigger than the party, which is not supposed to be so. You know, if the party has taken a stand, you know, that this is our, you know, manifesto, this is our mantra, this is our promise to Nigerians that we're going to get local governments up and doing, you know, every member of the party should kowtow and make sure that he puts and implements that. You know, but in the case where the moment you are looking, you are, the party is only as important as when you are looking for a position, the moment you get it, then the party in itself in some cases tries to put you and say, okay, now the, the, the governor is the leader of the party. You know, all of a sudden he's the leader of the party. Uh, in some cases, they, they give uh, state governors as coordinators eh, of the party in particular zones. Meanwhile, there's a national vice chairman who is elected, you know, as the leader of the party in the zone. But all of a sudden, the people who are holding governmental offices, uh, you know, the party gives them preference. 
and shows that they are the leader. So they drag the party instead of the party dragging them. They lead the party instead of the party leading them. So once you have all this topsy-turvy and inconsistencies in even plans and strategies, it becomes very difficult when implementation time comes. Well, you know what they say, power corrupts. So <laughs> they should, that's what they do about how they sort all of that. But we have to thank you for coming on this morning. Ismail Ahmed O oh, and is a former national youth leader of the APC and a former senior special assistant to the former president on what social investment. Oh, we didn't get to talk about all of that. What's going on with that now with people? I have but no idea. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see because you say people should just be a little patient. They they always want to know. How long more do we have to be patient? Because when they keep looking at the indices going south, yeah, it causes their hearts to just beat faster. Absolutely. Mine beats faster every morning as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you're part of those making the decisions. So if it beats faster, good for you. <laughs>